Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval, where the luxury is unmistakably British, but nobody wears a top hat or a monocle. It's episode three of the Standing By podcast brought to you by our friends at Land Rover Jaguar Laval. Yes, sir. How did uh, I do, Ted? You did very well. Very you're much. you're um, you're a champion now at pronouncing Jaguar. You no longer say Jaguar. Can I uh, just point something out? Sure. If you're watching the video of this podcast, um, I'm the best looking guy in the room. He is the best looking guy in the room, and uh, I just wanted to point out: if you're wondering if I now live in a tent and don't have clothes anymore. <laughs> Um, no, we uh, recorded uh, three of these episodes on the same day. That's not true. We each only own one shirt. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the next episode yeah. bare chested. And I shouldn't uh, shouldn't be pointing that out because they, you know they used to always tell us never point out your mistakes. Maybe nobody will notice, but yeah. uh, oh boy, <laughs> and somebody will notice. Can we also at this point? Please pay um, a tribute to Poseidon. Poseidon is our technical producer. Yes. And uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Yes. Uh, Poseidon is uh, a bona fide podcast star. He is. He works. Um, Poseidon, what do you, what's the, uh, is, there a, is there a name for the grand, uh, like for the broader big picture here uh, with you and Pantelis and Mike? Is there a name of the studio, of the network of? Well, here it's Pantelis Comedy. Okay. Uh, uh, where we do the Pantalos podcast, uh, Pantalos French cast. Uh, there's two drink minimum happening. There's uh, the morning show. There's my show in bed with Poseidon. We do quite a few shows. So um, you've got like at least half a dozen podcasts going. Yeah, the intellectuals also that I do with uh, Guido Grasso. He does comedy also. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know Guido. Oh, Was Guido the one who went to? Did Guido go to Los Angeles? Guido, uh, or am I thinking of somebody yeah. else, yeah, he, another no, he Italian did, he guy? Did, oh, he did, yeah? yeah, yeah. Guido Grasso and his family own uh, Sapori di Napoli. Yeah, there you go. The, okay, uh, the unbelievable taste of Naples restaurant in uh, Old Bordeaux, New Bordeaux. Sorry, New Bordeaux. Yeah. New <laughs> Old Bordeaux. <laughs> Old Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, it's in the jail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, those inmates at Bordeaux, Guido they eat his, well. Guido and his first of all, Guido is hilarious in uh, in many languages, but I think really, really funny in Italian. And uh, does a lot of Italian shows. At, uh, where do they do those shows at Poseidon? At Leonardo da Vinci Center? I think so. Yeah. 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 I'm not 100%. And, and Guido and his family are just lovely, lovely people. And it's uh, when you go to the restaurant. I haven't been in a while because, of course, Covidia. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, they're, it's, like going, it's like going to Naples when you go there. It's all his mom's recipes. It's really quite unbelievable. And uh, there we are. There on we're on a, a Guido tangent. There, sorry, Poseidon. My favorite show of all the ones that the guys at Pantelis Comedy do is, and they're all good. But my favorite is Two Drink Minimum mm -hmm. with Pantelis and Mike Ward and Poseidon. And I was listening one day, and I don't know how you guys got onto it, but you were talking about they were talking about colostomy bags. And Pantelis says, uh, Poseidon, you know what a colostomy bag is, eh? And Poseidon goes, Yeah, isn't that what people use when they're born without an arsehole? <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Ward says, if I was born without an arsehole, that would be in my Twitter handle. <laughs> At born without an arsehole. I laugh so hard. I have, when I listen to two drink minimum, uh, the belly laughs are guaranteed. You must have a ball doing it, eh, Poseidon? I love it. I you love must that. have a ball. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, they have to it every week. Yeah. People talk about the chemistry that you and I have. Yeah. Mike and Pantelis and Poseidon have that same chemistry. There's a really good flow to yeah. two drink minimum, and they go off on tangents like we have been accused of, uh, of yes. doing over the years. It's a, it's a terrific show, and uh, they've well, got a terrific setup, and we're pleased and privileged to be part of it. Yeah, we're absolutely thrilled. And I was just seeing, um, first of all, the building is within uh, throwing distance of Cafe Gentile, mm -hmm. which if you're a Montrealer, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and we were just over there, and I was telling Poseidon, um, this place is a cauldron of creative minds and creative thinking yep. where things get born uh, as you have the thought, which is something that is uh, has been missing from uh, our metier 
in the last, uh, I would say, 10 or 12 years or so. Um, we're used to, or we came up in an era where when we thought something, we thought of something, if we had an idea, the idea was born in your brain and usually executed that it, if it wasn't within the hour, it was the day or the next, you know, that day or the next day. And, and that's been sorely missing. And I've felt today, while we've been recording these episodes, like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. Because anything that we can think of, we can do. So tip of the hat to Pantelis and Mike and Poseidon and Phil and everybody involved. Yeah, these guys are ahead of the curve in podcasting. Yeah. Pantelis got in on the ground floor. He's been How long has he been podcasting? Poseidon, like maybe 10 years or so, Pantelis? Uh, 11 years. Almost. 11 years, yeah. eh? Yeah. yeah. Longer longer than most. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not kidding. When I say that they're podcasting stars, you guys get fan mail from all over the world, eh? Yeah, yeah we get uh, some fan mail. Yeah. You get like people send you art. They yeah. Yeah. like people draw pictures yeah. of them yeah, and send them to a them. lot of uh, fan art. Uh, yeah. Just recently, we got um, uh, what was his name, Mark Chabot, I think. Uh, he sent us. Uh, he made a uh, uh, artwork, but in the form of like uh, a comic book cover. A penthouse, and actually, I'll show it to you guys uh, after this. It's pretty cool. That's the most recent one that we got. We get letters sometimes. It's very it's time, cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Mike and Pantelis have, have uh, moved in the highest circles of podcasting as well. I yeah. I believe they've both been on the Joe Rogan show, have they not? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and they were also involved for a while with, is it Anthony Cumia? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. From, Opie From Opie and Anthony, Anthony wow. which is yeah. you know one of the biggest uh, uh, radio duos mm-hmm. in America, or was one of the biggest yeah. radio duos in American radio. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much you know you don't get much higher in the food chain uh, than guys like that and uh, and Pantelis uh, and uh, Mike and and Poseidon and those guys are uh, they're operating at that level. And for now, you have to deal with us. Yeah, now that's there's you, us. All, yeah, all poor you guy, eh? <laughs> it's all you yeah. got now. It's, it's just uh, us. Meanwhile, back to us. Yep, standing by. <laughs> We thought um, we would uh, talk about the tale of, uh, I don't even remember the year, to be honest with you, Ted, Um, but uh, things were going swimmingly at uh, Mm Shom back, I think, in uh, 19... It was 1992. 92. Yeah. When uh, the phone rang and uh, they wanted to know if we would like to go work at Mix 96. and Well, I, they wanted to know if you would like to go and yes. you said, yes, but I have to bring my radio wife with me. Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, I did. And it started um, and uh, I got a nice note from Gary. Gary Slate owned a company called Standard Broadcasting. The Slate family um, are a legendary radio family and now legendary philanthropists. Yeah. Um, they sold the company for a great deal of money years ago and have uh, been since dedicated to giving that money away to various charities. Uh, for example, for example, for example, <laughs> they gave have they heard of the Ted and Terry Need <laughs> New Shirts <laughs> Fund? <laughs> we'll ask Gary. Yeah. Um, they gave $50 million to a hospital in Toronto to give you an idea of, of what they're up to. Anyway, Gary was a real radio guy and bugged me to go work for his company. And we got together um, in Toronto for dinner and a fairly long, and when I say fairly long, I mean a very long after dinner meeting in a hotel suite in Toronto that lasted to the wee hours of the morning. Yes, I've been in on some of those meetings. Yes. Those were quite legendary. <laughs> yes. And I said to Gary at one point, I said, what, what is it about getting me to come work for Standard Broadcasting that's so important? And he said, God damn it, I want the best talent in the country to come work in my place. And I thought, wow, okay. That's flattering. That's very flattering in uh, Gary's uh, kind of way. And that led to a conversation uh, that had us uh, crossing the street from Shom to Mix 96. And I have to, it's hard for people to imagine, but people thought we were nuts. Yeah, well, they thought we were nuts because we were going from a classic rock radio station to a top 40 radio station. And I remember, I specifically remember another uh general manager of a radio station saying to you you'll be nothing 
without rock and roll records. Yeah. You yeah, well, that. guess fucking what? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I remember, I remember being very surprised and, uh, I think I, I still may be surprised that people associated me and us with rock music. They, they didn't, they couldn't, they couldn't see past, you know, what we got was, yeah, I can't wait to hear you introduce your first Madonna record. And I, I thought to myself, you know, the, the, uh, the nature of the game, the nature of radio and broadcasting back then anyway, was um, connecting with a listener, connecting with a human being. And I, I didn't think it mattered what kind of music they put around you. you. Your job was to connect with the listener. Yeah, but I think listeners probably look at it differently than broadcast professionals do. Like mm-hmm. that, I don't think that would necessarily cross a listener's mind, especially a rock and roll True. listener. Like, you know, I remember being, you know, when I was a teenager, I was a rock and roll guy. I was a stoner. And disco yeah. sucked, man. Disco <laughs> sucks, man. Rock and roll. So I think that's, you know, I think for a lot of people who listened to, to Shom, that was sort of... And I think that that's a, it's kind of a reasonable assumption that, well, you know, these are, these are rock and roll guys. I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're going to be able to, uh, to make that switch. Um, but at the end of the day, more than being rock and roll guys, we're professional broadcasters. Right. So we adjust to whatever format. Yes. Uh, is placed in front of us. Also, there were the raises. <laughs> <laughs> well, that helped a lot. Yeah. No, but you know what I'm saying was that we, yeah. you know, we, we had, to, we, made an adjustment and it's like being it's like being an actor you know uh an actor some guys get typecast or or women they'll get typecast in the same role but others can can adjust and 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 play many different kinds of roles one thing i learned about acting um when i had uh, an agent for a little while and she was getting me I wanted her to get me voice work. I wanted mm-hmm. to do, like, get me some voice work. I'll voice some commercials. I can do that. It's what I do for a living. But she got me a number of uh, of acting auditions, like just small little things right. like TV commercials right. and stuff like that. Right. And I said, okay, fine. I'll give it a try. And so I would get this this script, and I would look at it, and i go, okay. I, I remember specifically one time she said, uh, I got a thing for uh, a sleazy porn shop owner. You'd be perfect. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So she sent me the script, and I looked at yeah. the script, and I thought, uh, okay, I'll do it like this, and I think that'll be pretty good. So I rehearsed, and, and then I went into the audition, and I did it the way I thought would be pretty good, and the director went, okay, now try it like this. And I went, oh, <laughs> uh, you mean I have to make an adjustment? Yeah. You mean I have to take direction? I'm not a professional actor. I'm right. not a professionally trained, experienced actor, so I had no fucking idea how right. to take direction. And I and it was it, it. I just couldn't make that adjustment the way a professional right. actor could. But as a professional broadcaster, right. I I can move from one radio to a format to another and make that adjustment because I have the training and I have the experience. And when you say voiceover, you're talking about in a world where... You well, yeah, 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 or yeah, yeah. yeah, or just, you know, in yeah. my case, uh, I was the voice of uh, Renault Depot in Quebec for yeah. 10,000 years yeah. until the pandemic came along. I'm still here, by the way, Renault Depot. <laughs> Call me anytime. If you want to do any more commercials, right over here, standing by. <laughs> That's Ted Bird, B-I-R-D. Yeah. Um, did, um, uh, so you, you didn't take to acting then? No, not at all. Uh, Yeah. No, uh, because maybe if I went and took some acting courses, I might be able to do it. You have respect for other people's professions. Well, yeah. There was a time during, uh, and this is going to sound weird because of podcasting now. Remember the era in the late 1980s when radio guys decided that comedians would make good morning show hosts? Yeah, but that didn't last too long. No, it didn't. Yeah. Yeah, no. I think they tried that a lot on the French side, in particular. Well, they're Did still they doing not? it. They are on yeah, the French side, eh? It. Yeah, but that's on the French side. That's one of the things that I I tell people about in our building, or in, in what was you know when I was working at Schoem, the the building housed four English radio stations and two French radio stations, two big French radio stations, yeah. Rouge and Energy. And when you drove into the parking lot in the morning, it was. Um, you could tell which guys were the English broadcasters' cars and which guys were the French broadcasters' cars because um, the English broadcasters were uh, uh, driving, you know, 
cars. Yeah. The French broadcasters were driving Bentleys and Lamborghinis and, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of money that, uh, that, uh, that some of these vedettes get paid yeah. is quite something. You told me that story, and then I went and I told my current uh, co-host on uh, Light 106.7, Tom Whelan, that story, and he said, Moi, je parle français. <laughs> <laughs> Moi aussi. Yeah, which I thought was pretty funny. But back to the the, the, the matter at hand. Yes. Uh, we did make that adjustment, and in particular you, because as the show host, you were the guy who had to introduce the Madonna yeah, records. I didn't have any problem with it. I and, really didn't. Yeah, I and, remember that one of the first records we, we played was John Cicada. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know who John Cicada was, but I liked the melody, and I thought it was a pretty good song, and I thought... I remember rolling that song. Tommy Butto, a producer we've talked about on this podcast before, um, was walking us through the music. And I remember that morning playing the John Cicada record and thinking, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. This is mass appeal music. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be fine. And uh, and people are going to come along. And boy, they did. Yeah. We won over a lot of skeptics. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, a lot of people followed us over to see if we yes. could do it. And most of them stayed, I yeah. think. And I think we also added a few as well. I want to I want to talk about that story a little bit more, um, but I, I would like to go back to acting just for a moment. Um, I'm I'm trying to recall because I I can't tell the story. You're gonna... I already know what story you're yeah, talking I about. Know. Isn't that weird? The, the turn, <laughs> the TV turn. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It's, there's, I don't know, where were we? What were we doing? And I think we were doing we, a promo for a comedy show. <laughs> and they and, and we were doing a television shoot, yeah. weren't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, I don't know what, we, we're sitting side by side. We're standing. Oh, were we standing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I had to, I had to turn to the camera and say something. Yeah. And I made a turn. That was more wooden than Pinocchio. <laughs> and Terry was in absolute stitches. Like I, like I literally, you know, I get my cue and I go like this. <laughs> Say, friends. <laughs> yeah, just. And didn't I lean over and awful. say, could you be any more wooden? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You, were in, didn't. you were just in hysterics, yeah. but it's. Uh... Ted, it won't surprise too many people that the Mersons are supporting the podcast. One of my favorite memories of the Mersons is that picture that we took the day you came to visit me. I was there doing a broadcast, and there was, let's see, there was uh, one, two, three, I think four generations of Mersons in that photo. Wasn't that something? Well, the Mersons go back a long way. Back when uh, Cote St. Luke was a, a tar pit, Og Merson in about 10,000 BC, after the uh, invention of the wheel, Og said, you know, if you put some rubber on that thing, it would run even smoother. And that's how the tire was invented by the Mersons. I didn't know that. That's why I might have made I might have made that up. Oh, did you? <laughs> but they are. They're a, a, a three generation family business. And the fourth generation is uh, is coming up fast. Uh, for now, it's the third generation uh, running the company. They've been in business for over 50 years. And uh, I think the main reason they've been in business for over 50 years is because not only do they do what they do well, but they do it honestly. And in the uh, automotive business, that counts for everything. Because how many times have you gone into a place? I'll tell you a Merson story. I had a problem with my car one time and I went to a mechanic that a, and a, a friend of mine suggested to me and the guy said, oh, you're going to need this done and that done and it's going to be $1,100. I went to Merson and they said, you need a new thermostat, $29 at Canadian Tire. That's how you build a business that's been around as long as they have. It's uh, honesty and integrity. Uh, they do what they say they're going to do. They uh, price it before they start the work. It's really a place where you can feel uh, comfortable when you take your car in that you're going to be well looked after and not taken advantage of. That's how Ted and I uh, got to know the Mersons, and that's how they've built this business. It's been at the same corner for over 50 years, just past the corner of St. Jacques and Cavendish. Call them at 487-5545, or you can visit them online, mersonauto.com. It's a whole different kettle of fish, man. Yeah. Uh, that acting thing and like voice acting, I yeah. could I could probably do that yeah. okay. Yeah. But on camera, yeah, that's um, that's a whole other. Uh, yeah, it, it really is, and it's just it, the same way that that 
being on the radio and doing stand-up comedy are yes. uh, two different disciplines. Well, this is something that I've never understood. You, you, you were so you took to that uh, so well. I um, we used to host a, a, a show at the Just for Laughs Festival called the Montreal Show. I think Joey Elias has just done a new. Yep. Uh, uh, a new version of it did and I, I wasn't here to see them but um, apparently an amazing job um and i was thrilled that the just for last folks uh, brought the uh, montreal show back because the montreal show when we hosted it was a launch pad for a lot of very very talented people yeah john who, Rod- who went on to some yeah, pretty big uh, john gigs rogers uh uh, Barry, Barry Julian, Barry Julian, who is now, I th- is he the head writer yeah, for he, Stephen Colbert? I think he's one of the executive producers. Really? Eh? I got such, um, just want to tell this story now that we brought Barry's name up. I, I got the most beautiful, beautiful letter from Barry Julian upon announcing my retirement and a spectacular, I, I'm pretty sure he's the executive producer. I'll have to check because I got the kind of flowers you get when you're in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Like it was this giant, you know, I, I was like, what are these flowers doing in the control room? And I opened the card. It was from Barry Julian, who said he would never, never forget what you and I did for him. And all we did was brought him on the show. All and we did let was him talk, him tell the jokes. Sugar, yeah. Sugar yeah. Sammy does the same thing. Yeah. It talks yeah. about it. Anyway, the, the Montreal show was, was quite a... Uh, it was quite a um, uh, a launch pad for a lot of very very talented people, and um, I remember the first year we hosted it. I had to wear a ball cap because I sweat so bad. As I've mentioned on this program before, uh, it looked like I had just gotten out of a pool. Yeah, because I remember going on stage, and when you go on stage, the the light hits you, the spotlight hits you, and washes out the audience, so you can't see what's in front of you. But you can see the first couple of rows at a comedy club. You can see the first couple of rows of people looking at, up at you. And they're looking at you like, okay, entertain yeah, me. Make me laugh. Here we go. It's up to you now. And it just scared the shit out of me. But you took to it like a duck to water. Well, I mean, I, I liked doing it. And I, you know, I did enough of it that I got a little bit uh, comfortable on stage. But I still was not and still am not like a polished right. pro. Like guys like... You know Joey Elias and Derek Sagan and yeah. and those guys. Like I just I marvel at uh, Joey is so so relaxed on yeah. stage. Yeah. He's so relaxed on stage, and he'll you know Joey has a Joey has a, a huge uh, reservoir of material. But I've seen him go up and riff for oh, yeah. forty five minutes and yeah. just and just play off the audience yeah. and be absolutely hilarious. John Rogers, who you mentioned, who uh, went out to Hollywood early 90s been there ever since. and has been there ever since yeah. as I, i'm not sure what he does as writer showrunner um I, I don't know the way television and movies work yeah. but i know that he i know he does well i know he's got his own parking spot on a movie lot well there so you go he's done well tom whalen <laughs> told me another great story about uh, about john when David John McCarthy god rest his soul passed away about what was that three years ago or so I think longer than that. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, David DJ was was uh, was one of the gang in the Montreal stand up scene, yeah. and so a lot of the guys came back. A lot of the guys who had left town came back for his funeral, and Tom was telling me that he was talking to uh, to John Rogers about about life in Hollywood, and and John had a great description uh, of of the business of Hollywood. He said, imagine a hose, and half of what comes out of the hose is money, and the other half is shit. (laughs) And if you want the money, you also have Have to to take the the shit. shit. Wow. That's a, Isn't that something? Yeah, well, it's it's beautifully described by a hell of a writer. John Rogers yeah. used to close the Montreal show and kill every yeah. single year until uh, until he moved to Hollywood. Um, we got off the track, as, yes. we, as we often do. That happens. Uh, about our time at Mix 96. And uh, I wonder, you know, what, what some of the stories are that we should tell. <coughs> Pardon me. Um and I guess uh, one of the stories that we should tell is when we left Shom, they didn't seem to know what to do. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Let me take a drink of water. Have some water, will you? While you're doing that, I'll have some water as well. 
already standing by. Um, when when we left, um, and I don't remember the order that it came in, but um, we did very well ratings wise, proving that I I could be somebody without rock records. Yep. And uh, the general manager who told me that I would be nothing without rock records started to try and figure out what to do. I think the first guy he brought in was John Derringer. Yes. I think. Um, and uh, John is a lovely guy who's had an unbelievably successful career in Toronto. He's he's a uh, what we call a legacy morning man. Iconic. Yeah, yeah. at uh, Q107 in Toronto. Still there. Um, there's no footmark on his back. No. Nope. And he has um, uh, done so well there. But in Montreal, he got off on the wrong foot because... I think the second or third day he was there, he wore a Leafs sweater to uh, the radio station and began to talk about his love for the Toronto Maple Leafs, which may work in a lot of other towns. I know that works in Calgary. And when I was in Calgary, I was stunned by the amount of different sweaters you would see at uh, the uh, Saddle Dome or at uh, the football field. Probably because a lot of people are from somewhere else. Yeah, a lot of Saskatchewan fans, a lot of Owls fans, tons of Habs fans. Um, so the Derringer thing uh, didn't last very long. And I think after Derringer, wasn't it Howard? I believe so, right. yeah. yeah. They decided that the way that they were going to blow us out of the water was hire Howard Stern. And truth be told, they did. For the first couple of ratings periods... Howard Stern wiped the floor, not just with us, but with everybody. Yeah. But our boss at the time, Rob Braid, our general manager, said that the key to competing against Howard Stern is to have strong local personalities. And he uh, he just was, you know, just stay the course. He was steadfast yeah. in his support. Do what you guys do. Yeah. And uh, eventually the interest in Howard Stern in, in Montreal yes. waned. And we actually posted our best ever ratings while competing against yeah, Howard at, Stern. Not at the beginning. Not at, at the at beginning. No, he but, wiped the floor. Yeah, with no, but us. Yeah, yeah, but but by the end. Yeah. And a friend of mine, David Shadia, uh, said to me when Howard Stern first came to Montreal, he said to me, "What are you guys going to do?" Yeah, I, I got asked. I like, got you asked, guys are fucked. Yeah. It's Howard Stern. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah, I I got asked if I was going to leave the business. Yeah, yeah. And then David said to me uh, after, after uh, uh, interest in, in Stern waned and our ratings went back up again, uh, David said to me that, and this was his impression, he said listening to Howard Stern was, was like watching porn for the first 10 minutes. Fascinating. Really, really <laughs> interesting. He said, but then after that, it's the same thing over and over again. Now that was in yeah, this that was in the late nineteen eighties. Howard Stern, I think, has since, uh, and I, I haven't followed his career closely no. and his style, but I think he has since reinvented himself as a he great has. interviewer. He has, and and I got. He's say, not all about. No. He's not all about shock anymore. No. And I got to say, he 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 was the first. He was a he's a groundbreaking broadcaster. Yeah. And he earns every penny that he's paid because yep. he's he's paid you know ridiculous amounts of money, but he earns every dollar. He changed the face of satellite radio. He really did. And Sirius uh, XM exists because of Howard, as far as I'm concerned. That's just my personal opinion. And it was it's a bit of um, a bit of a, I get a bit of a kick out of the fact that at one time in the 1980s or the 90s or whenever it was. Um, Howard Stern had apparently reportedly bought burial plots or was going to buy burial plots for you and I. Well, that's what he did in every new market right. he went into. He'd and, find out who were the leading right. bri who were the leading uh, morning men in that market, and he would buy burial and, plots. And we them. did get mentioned on the Howard Stern yeah, show. We got because, slagged off. Yeah, we got slagged <laughs> yeah. off, but Howard Stern did mention our names. Yeah. <laughs> so and and us <laughs> us eventually beating Howard Stern in yeah. the ratings doesn't mean we're better broadcasters no. than Howard Stern, or else no. we'd be making five hundred million dollars yeah. a year. But under the circumstances at the time, yeah, um, 
that's the way it worked out. And a lot of the credit goes to Rob Braid yes. for the strategy that um, that he employed, which was basically just do what you guys yeah. do yeah. and you'll be fine. Yeah, keep your hands on the wheel is yeah. what he used to say. And I, I must admit, it was very unnerving. When he first got to town, it was very unnerving because people were asking us what we were going to do and what we were going to do when we lost our jobs. Like, you know, it was, it was very, very unnerving. And I can't remember the circumstance, but Ted and I were in a studio one morning after the show at the mix. And, um, you know, we, when you look back on it, we were, you know, we had, had, had these great ratings at Shom, went over to the mix and, and had even better ratings at the mix. We took all our, you know, most of our audience with us. And then Howard Stern came and wiped the floor with us. And we were, you know, we were getting handed our asses. And it was so frustrating professionally. It was so aggravating because there really was nothing that we could do except what Rob told us to do. Yeah. And one day somebody said something to me or, you know, somebody read the story about the ratings or, you know, or somebody asked me what we were going to do now that we were shitty or something <laughs> like that. And I picked up a coffee pot and I don't know if you remember this, but I grabbed, you know, one of those old office coffee pots that was, you know, with the burner on, you know, the burner on the bottom and the burner on top. And I grabbed it and I <laughs> flung the thing and it hit the window overlooking Fort Street and it cracked the bottom of the double or triple pane window. It was a soundproof window. Right, in the studio. Yeah, yeah. and it cracked it, and the, the, the fucking coffee pot didn't break, but the window got shattered. And uh, Rob threatened to take that <laughs> out of my salary and was furious with me for losing my cool, as he should have been. I was an idiot. And that ended up in Frank Magazine. That did that. Yeah, that was the. Was that the basis of the article yes, in Frank Magazine? It was hot-headed, you know, or Howard Stern ratings, Sparks, you know, I don't know. What what was I? The overpriced, um, um, overpaid, overpaid mouthpiece. Yeah, overpaid mouthpiece, right. and I was your B grade Ed McMahon sidekick. Yeah, we don't talk much about that uh, that Howard Stern thing. That was. Uh, that was kind of an interesting time in our careers when you think about it. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's, you know, uh, it's not because uh, we're better broadcasters than Howard Stern. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that uh, our ability to come back and, and win that battle had to do with the fact that uh, um, we're local. And Montrealers yeah. are intensely local. Yeah. And Montrealers want to know about their own town and want to, they you know, yep. he was not relatable to Montrealers, and right. he was he was in his shock radio yeah. phase well, at that you point. Remember, he ended up on the front page of the journal because he made fun of French people. Yeah, well, he that's a bad start. He, well, yeah, but he and he and he he lumped Quebecois in with France yeah. French. Yeah, like he was making jokes about you know surrendering and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and right. that's you know that's France. Yeah. It's, that's a whole different. That's a whole different thing. I thought about you the other day because I was um, I was out for dinner with my wife. And, uh, I said to the wait, the waitress came and she said to me, um, you know, can I bring the dessert menu? And I looked up at her and I said, no, I think we're going to wave the white flag. And there was this long pause and she smiled and said, eh, and walked away. <laughs> and I she had thought, no idea what you were saying. Not a fucking clue. Yeah. And I, I was stunned by that. And my wife said, my wife, just so you know, is much younger than I am. And my wife said to me, Tara, she doesn't know what you're talking about. I said, it's a white flag. The, the white flag. Everybody knows. Sign what the of white, surrender. Sign of surrender. Yeah. You, you wave the white flag when you're surrendering. She said, Tara, it's World War II. <laughs> it's like 70 No, years. I think people are still waving the white well, flag. And that's they? what I thought. I thought, like, you know, if. if uh, maybe not. Maybe they text their, Maybe they text <laughs> it now. We give up, LOL. <laughs> OMG, you guys are killing us. We give up. <laughs> but do you, do you use, do you, do you, is that a, do you use the, you know, it means I give up. Yeah. I surrender. And, and what I was saying to the poor waitress was, you know, we've eaten too much. I don't have room for dessert. Yeah. That reminds me of the, uh, <laughs> of uh, the story of, that you heard the time you drove across Canada. And you were driving through Brandon, Manitoba, and you heard the funeral announcements on I the did. radio. I Tell did. that story. That's such yeah. a great story. 
Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is brought to you in part by my good friends at Matla Bonheur. Ted and I are talking about this all the time, and that's in this day and age, the lack of service, the lack of being paid attention to, the, you know, walking into a store and getting ignored. Uh, that's one of the things that I love about Matla Bonheur. I promise you, no matter what location you choose, there are 17 of them, when you walk in, you will be warmly greeted. Uh, they'll ask you a couple of questions about what you're looking for. And in those specially designed stores that are specially designed around a better night's sleep, you'll see lots of mattresses. They'll let you uh, choose one after they ask you a couple of questions. They won't pressure you. This is the other thing that I don't like. Ted, do you like people following you around, bugging you when you're trying to shop? No, sir, not one bit. I like attention and I like service, but I don't like pressure. Yeah, well, you won't get any pressure. You'll just get kind, wonderful, warm service from this locally owned, family-run business. If you're looking for a better night's sleep, you are looking for a Matla Bonner store. Start on their website, find a location near you, matlabunner.ca. We should preface it by yes. saying back in the day, and yeah. I guess still at yeah. smaller radio stations. There was a time in this country yes. where there were radio obituaries. Yeah, and every radio station, this is, you know, when the this is a big country we live in. You know, I don't know if you've ever driven across it. But it's a I big, have not. I would like to sometime. You should. It and, really and is I fascinating. And I may yet. We'll yeah. see if yes. I get my my <laughs> class one license. Right. And um, in in the nineteen you know fifties, sixties, and seventies, all radio stations or all communities, small communities, medium sized communities, small communities, large and small, all across the country had a local radio station. And uh, so you could be in a Charlottetown. Uh, you could be in uh, La Vie. You could be in Mississauga. Mississauga has its own radio station still, I think. And in all of the small towns, it was always fun to listen to because it was usually staffed by young people. I know, you know, they're mostly young trying to be broadcasters today in, in big, big cities. And that's a whole other story that I won't go into now. But back then, if you wanted to get your start in the business, you would go to Brandon or Kenora or Drumheller or uh, Medicine Hat or Churchill. Churchill. In your case, yeah, Churchill, Churchill, Manitoba, Manitoba, Charlottetown, PEI in my case. Right. So you would go to these small towns. And these small town radio stations were, they were like the town square. If you've ever been to Italy, there's always a big piazza where the, everybody gathers. Well, in a place like Brandon, the town square was the local radio station, CKX. And it had young people who had to do things like swap shop. Swap shop. Remember swap shop? <laughs> yeah. You would host a, a call-in show and people would call in and tell you about their bug-infested old shit that they wanted to sell for $11. Yeah. And leave or trade, right? Or yeah. trade, right? It was called swap shop. I and got a leaky radiator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a mattress my grandmother died on. I'd uh, like a uh, thirty dollars for it. You can call me. So it was. It was always entertaining in its own way. And yeah. this one particular day, I was driving through Brandon, getting a kick out of listening to the local station, and I I stumbled on the obituaries, which were a service to people in a small town, mm -hmm. especially small towns without newspapers. Yep. Somebody would pass away, and and you would you would have to go during the news package. There would right. be uh, when I worked in Charlottetown, right. the major I think the noon and the six o'clock news package. Right. Part of it was the obituaries, the radio obituaries, and a big radio prank always was someone would either moon you while you were reading the obituaries, or they would make funny faces. Or very dignified. Yeah, very, very <laughs> dignified. I'll I'll tell the uh, dick out on the desk story one moment. Oh, God. <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> and um, this one particular day, none of that happened. But the 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 kid that was reading the obituaries said, Frank Johnson, Frank Johnson of Brandon, Manitoba, wife of Catherine, leaves two children behind, uh, Anthony and Charlie. 
and uh, the service will be at uh, such and such a place at such and such a time in lieu of flowers, uh, the dedication, uh, the donations may be made to the St. Brandon's Hospital Association. Uh, Mr. Jackson was a veteran of WW11. <laughs> And I nearly drove off the road. <laughs> and we have to explain it, no doubt. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it was obviously WW World War II, but the two was written in yeah, Roman numerals. Numerals, right. And she read it as 11. Exactly. Yeah. Really? A11. Wow, wow, I missed three <laughs> through 10. <laughs> Um, and uh, just quickly, this the, the uh, dick on the desk story didn't happen to me. No, um, but it happened. It was it was, and I don't remember the actors, but uh, there there was always, especially in the days when you know radio was. I mean, it was a big deal. We were talking about this in our first podcast about newscasts and how important they were and how serious it was. And, you know, you couldn't laugh during the news. You couldn't break a smile, you, you know. So that's why people tried to throw you off. You know, there was the famous one where they would, someone would tiptoe into the room and light your, your, uh, your copy, copy on fire. On fire yeah. and, and you would, you know, you would hear, <laughs> hear the sound of flapping papers as they tried to put the flame out. And apparently this one day at CJD, one of the legendary news readers was reading the news on CJD and a, a confrere who had uh, apparently brought his flask to work um, during the 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at news. So, no, so nobody was in the radio station, tiptoed into the, uh, the newsroom where the guy was reading the news and did his fly down and flopped his oh, no. dick right on the desk to th try and throw him off. And without meeting, uh, without like missing a beat, the guy kept reading the news and leaned over and went <laughs> <laughs> and slammed oh, his Christ. fist down on the guy's <laughs> dick and just kept reading the news. Wow. So that's, we're way off to, uh, the Mix 96. That'd be now. a firing offense, eh? I'm um, just. <laughs> While we're while we're thinking of it, the, the WW11 girl, we've all been there. Yep. And a couple of my a couple of the uh, of my most memorable yes. gaffes were and early in my career, uh, Jean Sauvé, a former Governor General who at the time was the Federal Communications Minister. On the news, I called her Jenny Suave. <laughs> and when Jimmy Stewart, uh, the actor, was suffering from sciatica, I said he had skiatica. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> and that was on CFTR in Toronto, oh a huge radio God. station with a yeah. huge audience. I don't know what I was doing working there. But and what did the boss say that day? Well, I was. it was late at night, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, so, someone fo a listener phoned me up and corrected me. And we've been around long enough that I now have Skikatia. You have Skikatia? <laughs> Skiatica. Skiatica, yeah, yeah. But why did why did I not think, and well, why did that girl not think to ask? I don't know. It's uh, I was reading sports one day, and uh, I I read Vincent Damphouse. <laughs> so yeah, I get it. I really do. Apparently, Vincent's kids are both uh, great hockey players. Is that right? That you mentioned he, Vincent lives not too far from where my kids live with their mom. Uh -huh. And my daughter went to school with uh, one of his boys, mm. and both boys are now like elite level. No kidding. Um, Minor hockey players. The old apple doesn't fall yeah, far from yeah. the tree. Yeah. Uh, is but the anyway. apple, apple fall f far from the tree? Is that like the white flag? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's a tree, sir. <laughs> so there's probably no apples. Can we get you something else? Um, uh, mix 96. I, yes, Mix 96. Um, there were there, one of the, my favorite uh, things about that era was the travel we did. Oh, boy. Um, it was an era of radio where, and you may remember this if you listened back in those days, um, trips were not uncommon. You could win a trip. And one of the things that I loved about it was it was win a trip with Terry and Ted like that was some kind of prize. <laughs> well, people seem to like it. And we did one particularly, uh, well, actually, we did it for three years in a row. Yep. We got involved with KLM. Yes, we did the Dutch National Airline, and the promotion was Tiptoe Through the Tulips with Terry and Ted. Yes. And we flew to Amsterdam uh, at the height of the Dutch tulip season yes. in the springtime, mm -hmm. 
And uh, we should say hello to Patrick Martinet, yes. who was the uh, uh, he was the chief cook and bottle washer, who was in charge of that for KLM, and Lucy Fournier, yeah, and uh, Sylvie. Yes, I can't wow, remember. Got, well, I can't. Why can I not remember Sylvie's last name? Then. Well, Sylvie, I know Sylvie's daughter. I think yeah. they they live out in Saint Lazaro, close to where uh, mm-hmm. where the radio station is uh, that I work at now. And so they would put us and a bunch of winners, listeners, and winners. Uh, on the upper deck in business class on KLM. Upstairs on the 747. On the 747. Where you could go into the lounge and have a smoke. Yeah. And they would fly us over to Amsterdam, and we would stay in a nice hotel and, mm-hmm. and tour around Amsterdam. Yeah. And one year when we went, one of the things about Amsterdam is, uh, and of course, I mean, this is not a big deal here now because it's legal here now as well, but in Amsterdam, long before cannabis became could be legally purchased here, you could get it in Amsterdam at coffee shops. And so uh, back in the 90s, when uh, we were uh, in more party mode than we are now, that was one of the delights of going to Amsterdam. And uh, one night, I went over to the Bulldog Cafe, which was a famous... uh, Still is, I think. Is it? In Amsterdam? I think think the Bulldog's actually a chain. I think there are a few of them. Anyway, you could buy hash at the Bulldog Cafe. at the Bulldog Cafe. So I went over to the Bulldog. We were in the Lights of Plane in Amsterdam, one of the main squares, and I bought a chunk of hash, and it was uh, a two and a, gra- two and a half grams of hash. It looked like a piece of Wrigley's gum, only it wasn't the color of yeah. gum, but it was, it was that long. So I brought it back over to where we were sitting and having our beers in the square, and then I realized, shit, I don't have any rolling papers. And I said to Terry, well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, just, we'll cut it in half and we'll each just eat half. I said, I've done that at home and it's, you know, you get high and it's, uh, it, it'll work just fine. Now, back here, we would buy hash in one gram chunks. Mm-hmm. This was a two and a half gram chunk. Can, can I just say, I was not an avid smoker. I had asthma when I was a kid. So the, that was not... That, that was, was not your thing. That was not my yeah. thing. I was I was uh, as many beers as you could get in yeah. me kind of guy. Um, so this, I I was like, oh look at look at this. It yeah. was men, you know, when it was illegal here over there, we were sitting in the square and there were guys in suits with briefcases rolling joints in the open, and yeah. I thought this was this was something I'd never seen before. So I cut the gram of I cut the two and a half grams in, in half, thinking in my head that it was only one gram and that we were each only going to eat half a gram of hash and we were going to have a get a good buzz and have a good time. And uh, so uh, we each eat our, our chunk and we're walking back to the hotel later, and um, and I said to Terry, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not feeling anything from from that hash. Uh, um, I don't. Th- I didn't even get high. And Terry says, "Yeah, and that's surprising because that was two and a half grams." <laughs> and I said, "That was two and a half grams. <laughs> Holy shit!" Anyway, night, night. <laughs> so we both go off to our rooms. About four o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I think, "Well, I'm having a drug overdose yep. in a foreign country, and I'm going to die." Yeah. <laughs> like it hit me like a ton of bricks, and it yes. was washing over me. And yeah. I sat on the edge of the bed and thought to myself. Holy Christ, I've never been this high in my life, and I'm getting higher by the second. And I thought, well, you know what? You've been high before. Just ride it out, which I was, I was eventually able to do. I was able to get, get back to sleep. And, then, and, and meanwhile, you were, and I was going to call you, but I, yeah. but I was too paranoid. I better not call him. Well, if the phone had rang, I'd have, I would have had a heart attack. Yeah, because you were downstairs I, having your own crisis. I was having a crisis of epic proportions, and... I I was for some reason we were in a hotel and I was at the I was in a basement suite yep. and I had cracked the window the window only opened to crack and I was standing on a chair <laughs> and the window was open and I was doing this <laughs> <laughs> trying to get and, some yeah, air and trying to because you wouldn't you, you couldn't leave the room yeah. you know God God knows you wouldn't want to leave the room and, in, in, in that inter- yeah. and interact with people and and then I I remember toying with the idea I've I've got to give in and call the front desk and tell them to phone an ambulance i've got to because all i could say i could see 
in my head was um, it was uh, you know kind of like the uh, the the super tramp bars at the concert that were you know spinning yeah. round and round. <laughs> only it was Ted's face going. <laughs> Two and a half grams, two and a half grams, two and a half grams. I didn't even get high. Didn't even get high. Didn't even get high. Oh, God. Oh, boy. And then later that morning when I woke up, I went down to Terry's room, and we laughed we sure and did. laughed and laughed. Yeah. I mean, by this time, we had come down yeah. from the worst of it, yeah. and we were just we were in that goofy laughing yeah. phase and of, I, of being I, high. I said never again, and I never, never. Is that right? Ne- eh? Never again, yeah. yeah. Um, this would be... a. Uh, uh, an unfortunate spot to yes. uh, take time to uh, thank the good folks at Land Rover Jaguar Laval. Isn't it, Ted? They are the title sponsor of this podcast, and they are good Joes. Terry and I have known Nino and Renato from Land Rover Jaguar Laval for low these, uh, these many years, and uh, they sell a fine product. They sure do. We've Jaguar got and Land Rover, yep. They've given us a Land Rover Defender. Yeah. Uh, to drive for the weekend that we're recording these podcasts, and it is a beautiful, beautiful vehicle. And loaded. Yeah. Loaded. Yeah. I mean, this thing, you know, to look at it, you'd think, well, we could go to war in this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's uh, elegant. But why would we? It's too comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm too comfortable in yeah. this thing to go to war. Yeah, it's so elegant and beautiful and well-equipped, and uh, it's something that you can see at Land Rover Laval. Um, and that's where you should go. Uh, the reason that we love Land Rover Laval, uh, they have been so good to us. They were so excited about the podcast, which uh, thrilled me to no end. Because um, I wondered, you know, is anybody going to want to support us? And they phoned you a couple of times and said, yeah. please come and see us. And um, also, uh, right next to where you can see the Land Rovers and the Jags are the McLarens. Yeah. If you, it's like your own little car show in Laval. So if you, you know, it's the kind of place where you, you know, if you, if your kid's a car buff or you're looking for a new vehicle, you should drive up and see them in Laval. Yeah. Land Rover, Jaguar, Laval, Nino and Renato. And we should say hi to Adrian as well, who is their marketing director and uh, who's a big believer in this podcast project that we have going here. And we're uh, fine pleased to have them on board. Uh, They treat their customers and their staff like family, and they have treated us like family as well. And we're mighty grateful. Land Rover, Jaguar, Laval. Um, back to uh, the uh, matter at hand, which is uh, Mix 96. It, it all came to an end um, when, and I, I, I think it was because George Balkan retired, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, George Balkan was a, um, uh, a radio legend in this town. And uh, Rob Braid came to me and asked me to replace uh, well, not replace. That's the wrong word. You don't replace George Balkan. You f- you follow. He asked him. you to be yeah yeah to yeah, be next to be a successor. And uh, I I thought that they were insane. I thought anybody who followed uh, George was uh, committing career suicide. Um, and uh, then um, again, we go back to the days when radio people people who love the business owned the companies. Uh, the owner that I was speaking of at the top of this uh, podcast. Uh, Gary Slate flew into town and explained to me why he thought it was going to work and why he thought it was important uh, for the company that uh, that I go to see JAD. And uh, that was that. Um, I, I wasn't forced to. He told me, you know, you want to stay at CJD, Terry, you're, you're absolutely welcome to. We, stay at Mix 96, you mean? Or I stay at Mix 96, you're absolutely a welcome to, and, and uh, there's no need, you know, for you to go there. Um, anyway, him and Rob Braid convinced me that it was a good idea. And as I recall, Ted, you came along, did you not? Not right away, no. Not because right away. I stayed at Mix 96 and worked with, with uh, the late, great Andre Mazenev yes. for, I don't remember how long a period of time, but I think Andre and I were together uh, for uh, about 18 months. And uh, boy, did we have some laughs. He was, uh, we lost Andre uh, far too soon. Uh, he got sick and passed away a number of years ago, and I still daily use and say things that that I basically yeah. stole from Andre. Well, I, right. I borrow them from Andre, <laughs> but I honor him by always yes. pointing out anything yeah. anything uh, that I've ever used that uh, that I got from Andre. He I'm was always a good happy. Joke. Yeah, he re- he yeah. he really was. So yeah, I think it was about a year and a half later that I came over, and after Blackman or after Balkan left, Ted Blackman left, right. and I came over 
and uh, did the sports. Right. On CGE Dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened. Speaking of bloopers, yeah. somebody actually, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Chuck Phillips. Was You're it? listening to 3030 News on Montreal's news talk leader, CGE Dog. <laughs> That'd be CJAD. Thanks. Um, if you're going to get the letters wrong, could, it, could you at least use actual letters? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's at this point um, that uh, my uh, spider senses are tingling. Okay. I think it's, uh, it's time to wrap it up. And uh, once again, we want to say thanks to Poseidon. Poseidon, have we been boring you to tears? I hope not. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and again, thanks to uh, the whole gang here. That's, this has uh, been absolutely terrific. Um, and a big thank you again to uh, the folks at uh, Jaguar Land Rover Laval and a tip of the cap to my friends at Matla Bonheur and also our friends at Mersons. And uh, in our next episode, we have all kinds of surprises lined up. We'll be back next week in different shirts. (laughs) Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval. Because you're probably going to move up north at some point anyway, so you might as well drive a Land Rover and fit in.